Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us here at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum for our 2021 Spring Break Survivor Speaker Series. Today, we are featuring Max Glauben, who uh, experienced, lived through the Warsaw Ghetto, and also uh, life in a number of different concentration camps. And this week, we will be featuring a different survivor or a second generation survivor speaker each day. Before we get started, we would like to thank the following community partners for helping us to make this program possible, Faith Forward Dallas at Thanksgiving Square, International Rescue Committee in Dallas, Legacy Senior Communities, Texas Holocaust and Genocide Commission, World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. And again, thank you all for helping us to make this series possible. As uh, Mr. Glauben, Max, gives his testimony today, and questions occur to you, please feel free to put them into the Q&A uh, section at the bottom of your screen. Look for the little icon that says Q&A and you can type your questions there. And in the question and answer period at the end, we will try to get to as many of your questions as we possibly can. And now I would like to turn it over to Mr. Max Glauben. Good afternoon. As uh, Ms. Sarah Abar said, my name is Max Globen. I'm a survivor of the Warsaw Ghetto, five uh, different concentration camps, and I also made some trips back to Europe with students from high schools to see the places that were instrumental in the destroying of humanity, uh, people that were equally as important as we are, but not allowed to exist. I was born in 1928, January 40, 1928, and on September 1st, 1939, the country that I was born in and the city that I was born in was invaded by the Germans, occupied, and immediately we were the people that were not wanted by the German regime. My birthplace was Warsaw, a capital. We, I mean, my family and I lived in a free country. That's what Poland was. My father was in the newspaper business, a daily publication, a daily Jewish publication distributed all through Poland and Europe. We lived in a nice apartment on Mila 38, where later on, the, that was the designated area for the Warsaw Ghetto. At the beginning, we had certain freedoms. We were being uh, picked up and uh, discriminated against on the streets. And sometimes there were soup kitchens where not all the places were bad, but certainly not enough good places to accommodate all the people. Within a couple of months, if you were a Jewish person, you had to register with the Germans and disclose many things about yourself 
that you wouldn't when you lived in a free country. We were told that by telling him or answering all the questions, it would improve our lifestyle. But contrary to that, later on it was used to destroy us or pick us up, take us to concentration camp or to certain work details that were not that pleasant for some of us. Within a couple of months of uh, occupation, the Germans designated an approximately one square mile area next to the Jewish cemetery. And that area included the streets that we lived on and made the people that lived in that area that were Jewish to start building the Warsaw Ghetto. There were not too many Masons and other people, so all the people that built the Warsaw Ghetto were laymen and not treated nicely while it was being built. The area was closed up and was finished as a full ghetto in 1940, the end of 1940. Because of the conditions in that area, a lack of food, a lack of water, a lack of hygiene, during the building of the ghetto, a typhoid epidemic and some other diseases happened while it was being built. The area was quarantined by the Germans. No Germans allowed into that area. Thus, the Germans organized a group of Jewish people and they created a Warsaw Ghetto City Council. That council got 2,000 Jewish volunteers to become the policemen or the capos of the Warsaw Ghetto. I don't need to tell you of how confinement into one small, one square mile area with 2,400 apartments is, with no facilities to buy food, with some of the places being bombed out and destroyed with no water, no electricity or any communications. If a Jewish person had a radio and they were caught with it, it was a death sentence. There were many articles that we possessed were taken away from us and some of the articles like fur coats and expensive diamonds and jewelry was confiscated. And if you got caught with a fur coat, it could have been your death sentence because you were supposed to turn all the things in. Finally, at around October of 1940, the ghetto was opened 
to the public that lived outside that one square mile by registration at the beginning the Germans knew where most of us lived and made everybody that lived outside that one square mile area forcefully placed inside the ghetto. When we were forced in into that area, there was no assignment of room where you would live. So there was turmoil, daily call out into the squares that were inside of the apartments for all sorts of activities and people drawn out for work details or for cleaning of uh, maybe German apartments that the soldiers lived in or different work duties on the streets or wherever necessary. Because of lack hygiene and food, that one square mile area by 1942 and 43 had an epidemic of diseases that was in epidemic stages. People were dying in the apartments, making them unlivable. We had to hide because there were raids into that ghetto and people were being tapped in large quantities, either for big, dug out ditches that were dug outside of Warsaw, of Maine, Warsaw City, and people were disrobed and disposed of by shooting. 1943, the ghetto was half of what its size was at the beginning, and there were less than half of the half a million people that were placed in the ghetto. We were in such bad shape that all we had to do is either hide or if we were exposed in the apartments, we would be caught, placed on boxcars and taken to some extermination camps like Auschwitz, Birkenau, but from Warsaw, it was Treblinka and later Majdanek. In 1943, the Germans had some bad luck in Africa on the front lines and also they, when Poland was occupied, Germany took the eastern part of Poland and the Russians 
took the western part of Poland. They did that by signing an agreement that they both are going to invade Poland. They signed a agreement that they would not fight each other, but that didn't last too long. The non-aggression agreement was broken a year later. Germany invaded Russia, went up to Stalingrad, and that's where they stopped because the Russians actually stopped them. So in 1943, the Germans decided to start taking out up to 5,000 people daily to Auschwitz-Birkenau and from Warsaw to Treblinka and Majdanek. These people were sent to camps that were not operated efficiently as far as the gassing and cremating of the bodies were done. So they were placed in barracks waiting for their term to be gassed and then cremated, or their bodies burned. Because a lack of soldiers to guard them, escapees started running away from the camps, escaping, and they still had families in Warsaw and in Poland. So they went back to Warsaw warned the underground, and thus an uprising occurred on April the 19th, 1943, where young squads created by the underground watched in the apartments that were next to the gates watched the German armor trying to come in to destroy the ghetto, but not successfully. This went on from April the 19th until the end of May, where finally the Germans could penetrate the gates only by bringing in napalm flamethrowers and burning the one square mile area to the ground. The ruins fell on the places that we were hiding in, and these were the basements that we originally used as bomb shelters. And those were the best places to hide because one of the things about hiding in an upstairs, in a building facility with stories is if you try to maintain life and we didn't have any water, we didn't have any electricity, but we had wood and wooden stoves. Can you imagine trying to cook something or maybe warm some snow that we could obtain instead of water or rain? Because those were the only things that we can use a substitute for clean water. The wood would burn in the stove, but the smoke would come out of the chimney. So the Germans would go around, and if they saw any activity 
inside the apartments, then they knew there was life there. So we had to quit doing anything in the daytime and switched day into night and cooked on open fire in the back of the apartments, in the back alleys, so the Germans wouldn't know where we were hiding. The fighting lasted till about the end of May, and by that time, the ghetto was burned. We were hiding in a basement, discovered, taken out after they threw in a hand grenade and uh, destroyed some of the people on the wall that was going right to the street. They disrobed us, searched us, took away any possessions that we had and took us to a gathering place where all the people were taken before being loaded onto boxcars that usually went on a ride to Treblinka and later on Majdanek on a four or five or whatever long journey because the Jewish trains were taken were placed on sidings or side ramps to allow the regular daily trains run the regular schedules. When time came for us to be loaded on the boxcar, There was no ramp for loading because the box cow was just in like an open field. There was a four by eight plywood sheet that had one inch wood trim nailed to it. So when you started climbing on the 45 degree that the board was on, if you reached a certain plateau, you could not go back to the original start. And of course, they had Germans with guns and dogs that were maiming us, helping them to get us on the box car. Usually they counted no less than a hundred people. When the box car was closed, there were no supplies on the water, utilities, or whatever. And uh, standing room only, and you didn't know for how long or where you are going. And sometimes you wondered, why me? But that was never answered because when you live under these conditions, I think you get brainwashed and you live in such poverty that all you care for is how to get the next piece of bread or a drink of water or just to disappear from this world and you still don't or can't commit suicide because all you think about is survival and care for your family. After five days, the train stops 
And all I remember seeing is a sign Lublin. So when I was actually in Majdanek, which is right outside of Lublin, it was a camp that was basically a Russian army camp then converted into a death camp. Many people perished there. And in fact, I went back 14 times and in Majdanek only, there's a building that from, if you look at the horizon, looks like a mushroom. But when you get close to it, it has an entrance like the Lincoln Memorial. And when you get to the top, the, it has a 15 inch marble table all around the center of the building. And it's as big as this theater. And in the middle, there's no glass. There are pillars, four pillars that hold the round roof. But in the center, there are seven tons of human ashes that were created by the crematorium that is right pretty close to that building. We were offloaded the boxcar and set up in a military way, five abreast and women and children, everybody together. And we saw that we were about a kilometer away from the main gate and the Germans were set, setting up little benches with probably requisitions for how many people they could get that were able bodies out of the transport to be transferred into a concentration camp or to some place that they needed help. Once we were set up five abreast, women and children, an announcement through a megaphone came. We are all set up, women and children start marching toward the gate. Thus, I saw my mom, my family, my little brother with, that was next to my mom, start the journey into the camp where the gas chambers and the crematorium was. I was next to my father and I was gonna step right behind my mom and join her and my dad grabbed my hand and said, stay with me. Then after all the women were weeded out out of the group, they came and we were pretty close to the beginning. So my father was selected to be transferred to Budzin concentration camp that was next to an aeroplane factory. My father grabbed my hand. Thus, the Germans allow me by miracle to go with him. And I was transferred to that camp. Life in that camp was horrible. They had a I don't know exactly what the rank is, 
Obeshar Fira fights that would come out daily on a white horse and have us counted, then after that, he made a theatric way of hurting some of us, either by shooting or torturing in ways that are inhumane. We got one ration per day, and that was one slice of bread, depending on how big it was, and one bowl of soup a day, if you sometimes had a container that could hold the soup, and sometimes if it was distributed in a way that the person that was doing it was not rushed and spilled half of it before it went into the pot or plate or hat that you had for obtaining the soup. I lived there for about three weeks before we went on a detail on a Friday morning. And when we came back, we were counted as a head count and we had to have the same amount of people that went out in the morning. Now, how did we go to work? After counting, we would go in the sections that we were working in the private building, in the airplane factory. So we wouldn't destroy the decor of the factory. We would have to march to the workplace and sing. And if we didn't sing, you never reached the factory or you never reached the way back to camp. When we got back, we were 10 people short. So, No, we were three people short. So the Germans didn't wait till the accurate count in the morning by the Oberschar Führer. They took 10 hostages for each person, laid them out on the ground. My father became a hostage. The rest of us, were rushed into the barracks. Then we got up in the morning and went out for the count because they were laid out on the uh, Appel Square. That was the counting place in the morning. There were some bodies laying there but there were some bodies missing, and in the place where the bodies were missing were the person's shoes that were taken off of him as they were taken to the crematorium. I found my father's shoes there. Thus, I didn't know how he was killed, but I knew that I lost him. I didn't want to give the Germans satisfaction that they hurt me. And uh, through my beliefs that if you save one life and life must continue, it's the same that if you save the whole world, I continued and worked there in the carpenter shop. 
and I became a pattern maker for airplane parts that would replace damaged or shut up parts of the German Luftwaffe. And I worked on Messerschmitt and Heinkel aircraft. 1943 and 44, I'm transferred from Budzin to Mielitz, another concentration camp next to an airplane factory, but not knowing to me, Budzin and Majdanek are going to be closed. And all the people were going to be sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau. So after working in, my, in Mielitz, I see an influx from Budzin, and then they transfer Budzin and Mielitz to Wielitschka. German salt mines and another camp. By the time we all got there, the camp, the two camps were closed and there was not enough room for sleeping, working, eating, and it became fields of bodies. Then we were placed on trains that were sent to Auschwitz-Birkenau, but we never were left there because the tracks were full of human beings waiting to be transferred to that camp. So they took us to Plashov. That was the place where Schindler's List camp was. And from there, the trains were taken, not all of them, but just a few. On one of them, I was there. So about 1,600 people were taken to Flossenburg, Germany, the first Jewish transport. It was an international camp. Messerschmitt airplanes we were working on, and I stayed there from May 8, 1944, until April 16, 1945, where in the middle of the night I was called out by the Germans that were running Flossenburg and placed on the train. It was the only Jewish transport that left Flossenburg. When the train was loaded, and left Flossenburg, it reached the city of Floss. The American and the Allied fighter planes saw the train. The Germans were staying in the doorways. They thought it was German soldiers. They shut up the train three times killing most of us. A group of maybe 400 was then pulled out from the ruins and went on a dead march, marching at night or in the evening and at dusk we'd being placed into the woods 
so reconnaissance planes wouldn't see what was going on on the ground. We marched from the 16th of April, 1945, until April the 23rd. We came to a place where just recently I was able to get the name. It was New Kirtsen Balbini. And I know that it was a Sunday and they put us on a little hilly area surrounded us with machine guns and I believe there were less than 200 of us after marching for the whole week without food and without actual good sleep or any nourishment. When we were on that hill, they told us you surrounded with machine guns. If you try to escape, we're going to kill you. In the middle of the day, we hear a noise of engines, but it sounded different than airplanes. It ended up to be tanks. So about seven or eight of us youngsters that were in the dead march group and there were all the young people that have survived tested our ability to run down the hill to find out what the noise was about and as we did that the noise was made by american tanks of the third army general Patton's army and we were liberated so we screamed to the remaining jews that were left on the hill they finally came down the americans gave us all the food that they had on the tanks which was their food C rations, K rations, and some fruit that they somehow obtained because I was liberated in Bavaria, and that is apple country, apple cider, cherries. But this was April, and some of it was not quite ripe yet, so many of us got sick <laughs> when we went to a tree and try to eat it. First, the Germans wouldn't let us in into their homes. They wouldn't let us in into their homes, but one lady did. But in the morning, she evicted us because she says her neighbors might do harm to her because she helped us. We went out on the road that the soldiers were being moved advancing, but we were going the other way to the part that was already captured and not where the army was advancing. And as we went on the second day, behind us came a convoy of the 179 single, single repair company of the third army. And there was a lieutenant a second lieutenant in the first jeep, then it was a three quarter, then some two and a half ton trucks. And the man asked us, where are you kids going? 
So we were told that the United States was going to set up camps, displaced person camps for the survivors of the Holocaust, but we didn't know where they were. So the man was a real nice guy. He says, I want you guys to disrobe, gave us American uniforms, and tell everybody if they ask you, you are my helpers. And we roamed with him in Bavaria, around Munich, Augsburg, and we ended up in Nuremberg, Germany, and took over a caserne that the Germans were living in. And I stayed there for two years and became a mess sergeant for Polish guards that were guarding German POWs. I learned how to drive, how to speak English, and many other things. And I also was notified that I could try to apply for entry into the United States. I was placed in an orphanage in Aglasterhausen, Germany. I got papers and I finally was able to emigrate to the United States on a merchant marine converted ship, USS Marine Flasher. And I came to the States on December 13, 1947. I came from an orphanage. I was placed in an orphanage in New York. Needless to say, we went to many places in New York, museums, Radio City Hall, RCA radio station that's on top there. I saw the rackets, but people weren't too nice to us because I imagine we were in the orphanage. So I says, get me out of New York. There were no openings on this December 31st, 1947. I was able to get an afternoon plane from New York to Atlanta, Georgia. I was then placed with a Miss Rosenthal and that was a foster home, but I thought it was a unit of Jewish children's service, but I was treated right nicely. But after a while, I had a caseworker and they were caring for me, but I didn't like staying there and not doing anything. So I left and tried to get jobs and became self-sufficient, still living with Ms. Rosenthal. When I became 18, because I was on a regular visa, I had to register for the draft. Then in 1951, I was drafted into the United States Army. I was trained in Fort Hood. I became a mess sergeant in the Company B, 702nd Armored Infantry Battalion with a triangular patch. And I served two years of active duty and I was released, but I had to serve inactive duty for three years to make it a five-year deal. 
When I was released after two years, it was 1953, during my stay in Fort Hood, I would come into Dallas and people treated me the same way as if I was their family, especially the Fair family. So I met my wife, Frida, she's a Gappelberg, and I married her in 1953. I have three children, two males and a female in the middle. They gave me seven grandkids, and now I have three great-grandchildren. I live still in Dallas, and about 40 years ago, I was very ambitious, and I felt that I should repay for the good that was done to me in the orphanages and all through this time without me having family because my family was destroyed by the Germans. So I started a small group to try to build a small museum. But look what happened. Instead of a small one, we will build one, a big one, and uh, it's a, a beacon for liberty and justice and for human rights and for being the difference between a bystander that stood by and saw the Holocaust happen and an upstander that's being made when you come into this museum. You should go out an upstander, come in a bystander and an upstander, and then be separated and become an upstander. So this is my story, and it's a story of a human bubble that even though they took our education away and our livelihood, we still had enough in us by being humanely nice people and maybe became upstanders and could lead our life to this day by making family. I was liberated as one individual by an American soldier or by an American division. If I were to go to a restaurant right now, I'd require 20 some reservations. So out of that one liberation, there are 20 some people now that are replacing some of them that were lost in the Holocaust and we do good things in order to make this a better world. Exactly time, one minute over. Thanks so much, Max, You're for welcome. sharing your story. So the first question that's been asked is if you could tell us if any of your family, your extended family, survived the Holocaust. There was first one of my uncles when Zionism started in the late 30s was paired up with a young lady and that's the only way they could go to Israel. So he survived and I have family there from this one person or the two people, so maybe now 30 or 40 or 50, God knows. But in from the Holocaust, two of my father's sisters 
remained in Majdanek. They were taken to work there, then from there transferred to another camp. One was like a redhead and the other one was more with my uh, hairdo and complexion. She just passed away last year at the age of 99. But two of them found me in 1985 after the Holocaust, 42 years. And those were the only survivors that survived from my European family that were involved in the Holocaust. And now then, she has three children, and now the attorneys in Washington and uh, there's one, there's a teacher, one is an attorney, and they have children. So I got maybe like 10 different relatives that came out of the two aunts. One couldn't have any babies. And I have a picture of the one that passed away first, but this one had three children, so I had somebody. Those are the only survivors. Okay. Max, we have a question from Hannah Spahn. Uh, she wanted to first tell you how inspiring she thinks your, your story is, and she wants to know what kept you hopeful throughout all of this. Well, I mentioned one thing that in our religion, if you save one life, you know, then it's the same if you save the whole world. But if she was a child, was she ever denounced of getting something? Let's say like, if it was in our times now, if she wanted a phone and she went to her parents and they would say, you can have it. We don't want to give it to you. Just imagine and let her imagine of what she would do in order to obtain that telephone. She says, I'll go to work and I'll make it. We were denied life, and I didn't commit any crime, and I was born into a religion, and I was taught that we have 600 and some commandments, not all good, not all bad, but we have a blessing for everything that we do. We thank God. And we are believers. And if you are a believer, you cannot just throw your life away or commit suicide or do anything. So just the pure motion that you cannot do this to me and I will either outsmart you, I will do anything to sustain life. Does that answer that question? Max, Kathy Stock would like to know how difficult was it for you to return to Europe and revisit the places that you had been through during the Holocaust? I was denied education. And I really didn't have the instruments for a successful life. This is the looking statistically 
at the person. Yet, without education, one individual can learn enough to be able to get a job, to be able to do good, and to be a human, a good human being. And I don't mean too much success or less success, but on an even level. I went to Israel to visit with my relatives. When I came back, I went in 204. When I came back in 2005, I was asked by a lady that was running the March of the Living would I go back to Poland, you know? Now, I was in five different camps and I can't describe all the horror that I saw because each commander was different and each camp had different rules. And I says, I'll go. And my wife says, I won't let you go yourself. I said, I'm fine. So I went. And then I think we had like 20,000 kids. And then I saw what kind of life changing trip this was. So within me, everything that I do, I think about and I research before I do it, so I'm knowledgeable of what I'm going to do. The only way is education is the implement that's going to make this a better world and better people. So I chose the conversion from a victim to either, to the best of my ability, a storyteller, a factual and actual storyteller. And after I saw the results from the youth about making them better people, more religious with their beliefs, and then the change that the parents see in them, and the road that they take, that encouraged me to keep on going back. And that became my reward for what I do regardless whether it pains me or not. Does that make sense? That absolutely makes sense. Okay. So a couple of things. I want to thank everybody for joining us today and for uh, listening to Max Glauben's testimony. I also wanted to let everybody know that Max uh, and Jory Epstein have a book coming out on March 30th called The Upstander, which is the memoir of Max's life. Uh, Max has talked for years about his experiences, but finally has, has put it all down on paper. So if anybody is interested, again, it's The Upstander and it's available on Amazon. And we would like to invite you all to join us tomorrow at 1 for our next survivor slash second generation survivor speaker for spring break week. Thank you all and have a good afternoon.